is this the end of the uh, off-grid thing? Uh, is this is this it? Am I am I uh, through with it? Am I giving up? Am I throwing in the towel? I don't know. So today, um, I was just thinking thinking things through here, and uh, you know, there's there's some real challenges, um, you know, that happen behind the scenes of living off grid and you know developing property um, and doing all these things, homesteading, permaculture, you name it. There's some real challenges and. You know, not everyone is up to the task, um, and it's just, there can be a lot of stress involved, um, and sometimes it can push you to the breaking point. Um, so, right now, I'm kind of working my way through buying another piece of property, uh, theoretically, We'll see if it actually happens. I don't ever uh, get too hopeful with these things because you never know what's going to happen next. But um, the intention is to uh, look into another piece of property. It's in a beautiful place. It's uh, up on a hill in a forested area. It's not too far away from um, some of my previous videos. I've got a camp that's like flat and grassy. Um, it's not too far from there. And... Um, Basically, I'm just not sure uh, if off-grid would be an honest appraisal of uh, this channel. I think I'll keep making videos, but, um, you know, you notice you see a lot of channels, uh, Hawaii Off-Grid, or Off-Grid Hawaii, I think, is one of them, and I used to watch it all the time. They have more or less vanished. Um, they haven't made a video in a really long time, um, and it's just, I think they had a very common thing happen to them was just they just got burnt out and um, you know they wanted to be close to family and they wanted to maybe have a normal life you know quote unquote normal um, and I guess I should start off by explaining what got me here so when I was 17 18 years old uh, I was already frightened of the system you know um, I didn't really want to go to college I wasn't really interested in the standard route, you know, um, go to college, accrue a bunch of student loan debt, um, hope that you can get a decent job. I mean, at the time that I would have gone to college and gotten a degree, I, it was already pretty hopeless. I mean, there was so many, I saw the writing on the wall, I saw so many people uh, accruing all this student loan debt and never paying it off. My parents are, um, you know, examples of that. Um, they. I mean, I think they might be getting to the point where they paid it off, and they did not accrue very much. Um, but the amount of time that it took them to take that off their shoulders, and, you know, the real value of that investment. I mean, my mom is a physicist, and uh, she's a school teacher, you know. Uh, that's the substitute teacher, not even a full-time teacher. I think she might be like a professor now, uh, you know, low-key college professor or something right now. I don't keep that good of track, but, um, just, you know, <clears throat> and in my industry, um, I'm a computer person, I'm an IT person, uh, typically, I mean, at least that's the career path I've followed thus far. I was doing IT before I was even 18. I was doing IT while I was still in high school, in middle school, in elementary school, whatever. Um, and so for me, uh, I kind of already saw that, you know, really I just needed to refine and hone my skills and that college wasn't really going to do that for me. Um, you know, many of these degree programs, and I, I've met people, uh, you know, since then uh, in my field that say I went through school, I put all the effort in and here I am working making $13 an hour and uh, that's not going to improve anytime soon. Uh, you know, and they still work their asses off, but now they have $75,000 of student loan debt or whatever. And of course, uh, you might say in the comments, well, that's their own fault for not doing this wisely, but I just, I don't believe in college as an absolute requirement. I don't. Um, I think you can be an intelligent and well-educated person without having gone to college. Uh, I think that it's like saying that you have to have a, uh, a Kroger Rewards Card membership in order to be a real person. It's just not factually not true. 
um, you know, objectively not true. So, you know, and there are so many people that have lived such rich lives without ever going to college. So for me, college was never really that important. Um, and and I, I don't know if this probably isn't the best way to lead in, but what I realized at a pretty young age, at 17, 16 even, I might not ever be able to afford housing, um, you know, so I wasn't even worried about uh, college, you know, and my, my family life wasn't the greatest, I, you know, my parents are, it's a pretty standard story, my parents are divorced, they're both uh, pretty mental, you know, they're both uh, pretty unstable people, or at least at the time they were, it was, I never had a very stable childhood, um, you know, especially my, uh, the side of the family I ended up with was really unstable. Um, and so my childhood just wasn't that great and I just wasn't, um, I was trying to get out. I just, all I wanted was to have my own place to live uh, so I could kind of reset myself and become my own person, um, you know, and, and find out what I really wanted. Um, and over time I kind of started to recognize that that may not ever be possible unless I did something really drastic and found some really alternate way to pursue that. So I, you know, started obsessing over these cheap pieces of land and then learning about off-grid, uh, off-grid living, you know, and I, I think I started looking in California, um, which if you know anything about living off-grid, I wouldn't advise it in California. Um, you know, or really developing property, you wouldn't advise developing property in California whatsoever. It's just not practical. Um, it's so heavily taxed and there's the permits are so expensive and there's so many separate little requirements. It's not practical. It's, you know, they, they don't want people to develop property there. It's not just, it's not just that it's highly regulated. They genuinely, I don't think they want people, ordinary people to develop property. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, I started with California and then I looked in Hawaii, uh, which I'm still thinking about that, um, but in the context of some things I'll get to a little bit in a little bit here. Um, and then I transitioned to looking into uh, New Mexico, which I already lived in New Mexico. Um, you know, I had, I had, um, I kind of moved back and forth. Um, I've done a lot of like I, I would live with one parent then live with the other and they live halfway across the US so I would go back and forth a lot um, and I never really fully settled in any of the either location um, but New Mexico I did stay for longer periods of time you know I would stay here for two or three years at a time and I felt like this was more my home um, because around the time I was coming of age New Mexico or uh, Portland uh, which was the area of uh, Washington and Oregon that I was living in uh, that, that border area between Washington and Oregon, uh, Portland was exploding. Um, I mean, there was no, you couldn't afford anything. No one could afford anything there. It was a very difficult time to try and, you know, talk in studios for thousands of dollars a month. I mean, it was just insane. It was unrealistic. Um, I've always had pets too. And, um, you know, what I found is that typically inner city apartments, even if you're willing to take care of your animals and clean up after them, um, you st it's very difficult to find anything that's not a mess that allows pets. Uh, often actually allowing pets seems to be a tactic to sell uh, low-grade housing or housing that you know wouldn't be passable to most people. Um, and they will allow pets because they know people are desperate to find a place that allows pets. So, you know, it'll be Section 8 quality, or, you know, or lower, um, it'll be moldy and rotten and, you know, you, fixtures don't work and they just say, well, we allow pets though, so you're going to keep paying your rent. Um, and so with all of that and just, you know, thinking at the time, you know, starting out, I don't see myself being stable enough living with my parents to maintain a job. And in order to get away from my parents, I, you know, need a good enough job to afford that. And um, so initially, uh, kind of the first thing I did was, oh, Arizona. I have to mention Arizona as well. So when I was living in Washington, I was staying with someone, and they had land in Arizona, uh, two acres. 
and it was in Navajo County. Um, so very rural area, um, not very, not very uh, easy to live in. Um, it had no building codes, which was a big thing. Um, and I just decided, um, you know, maybe I could do this. Maybe this would work out better. Um, so, you know, or maybe this would work out at all. Um, so it was 400 bucks I paid for my first piece of land. Uh, two acres, $400. This was back in 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in there. Um, and, you know, 400 bucks. Cool, I've got two acres in Arizona somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, and I tried to go to it. I made a quest. I, uh, I, my dad helped me set up a camper or a, a minivan with like a bed in it. And, um, I took off and drove to Arizona to try and find my land. Uh, I made it to Flagstaff and I ended up being homeless, um, in, uh, in that van. I mean, I was, I had a home, but it was a van, you know, and I was, uh, I say homeless, especially because I was, I had no heat, first of all, uh, or no air conditioning. I had two dogs, um, and I, like, I, I switched between the Dollar Tree and the McDonald's parking lot in Flagstaff. Um, I remember I actually think I paid somebody, I paid, like, a bunch of dudes, a bunch of big burly native dudes. Uh, I say that specifically because they were like big. I mean, they were tough people. It was crazy. Um, and they kind of adopted me as like their, one of their family members for a little while. Um, but I paid them, uh, what little money I had to, uh, to push me up the hill. Uh, so it was like McDonald's is down here and Dollar Tree is up here and they pushed me out of that parking lot and up into the Dollar Tree parking lot or up into the Dollar Tree parking lot. And there was like four, uh, four other people parked behind Dollar Tree and RVs and vans and stuff like that. Um, I remember there was this really emotionally unstable guy that, uh, that lived there and he would like, he would like harass me kind of like I would talk to him and it'd just be like you know are you like uh I think I asked him for a cigarette because I used to smoke and he like grabbed my hand and like talked to me really intensely for like half an hour and wouldn't fucking let me go and it was sketchy as hell and he was like he would like scream at his wife and uh I think he also beat his wife I'm not 100% on that but it was he and his wife clearly had a very bad relationship um I remember one, there was one night where he was really going off on his wife and I was sitting there with my BB gun like ready to shoot at him. And I only had a BB gun back then. Um, but I was like, this fucking guy, if he comes over here, I'm going to fucking pelt him with this thing because this is scary. Um, and I couldn't move. So the van, uh, I should mention that, the van actually died. Um, and it turned out it just had a dead battery. It had a parasitic drain that would kill the battery. Um, but at the time, I didn't carry jumper cables. Um, I was very afraid to ask people for help, and, um, so I just existed like that, I was stuck there, um, I think at one point I got the van, I can't remember what order these things happened in really, but, um, I got the van started, and I was able to drive it up into the mountains near Flagstaff, and I camped out there for quite some time, uh, at least a few weeks, if not a month, I don't remember exactly how long I was there, in total, but a lot happened in a very short time, so it's hard to remember the exact time frame and what happened when. Um, I remember a couple of times I got temp labor jobs, and I was so out of it back then, I couldn't even find the job. Uh, this is, I think, before you had convenient access to things like Google Maps. Like, I would just look up the location where the job was, and I, like, it was like, uh, you could look it up on like map programs like or like a uh, map quest type thing i don't think google maps had as much penetration back then as it does now um i know i didn't have turn by turn navigation on my phone back then um so i think i might have even just had a flip phone so i didn't have any internet connection and you know i was trying to find this place and i got lost i got lost for like four hours on my way to the job and my job had started you know i was, I was four hours late and I still went there. I don't think I ever got paid. Um, but I went there and kind of, like, didn't know what I was doing. Um, 
<laughs> I remember basically the way I lived was I would um, I would go I would ride a bike down to Flagstaff I still have the bike somewhere I think it's on the Mesa uh, sitting somewhere I would ride the bike down to Flagstaff and I would um, it was like a hill a place called San Francisco Mountain or A1 Mountain or something and you would uh, I'd probably look it up on Google Maps or something um, or whatever uh, but you would ride it I would ride the bike up this hill and it was like a like a switchback road as a walking trail or hiking trail and biking trail for people I would ride up that um, to go home I'd ride down that to get to Flagstaff every day and I would go to the food bank I would pick up a sandwich and they give you like a sandwich a drink and a fruit cup um, and then I would I had some friends there um, you know some friends that I still know today um, that you know were friends before that had moved to Flagstaff um, and so I would ride over to them and see if there was a party a lot of the time Flagstaff will have events too where places give away food um, and in their case I, uh, I snuck into their apartment complex had a thing that was like a barbecue for the apartment complex and I snuck in there and stole a couple burgers um, and you know it's like that just whatever I could get I would eat um, and I would you know usually try to finagle like a beer or something or some weed uh, to smoke when I was down there um, you know and I would just kind of take all my provisions and stuff them in my pockets and a backpack sometimes and just ride back up the hill um, and uh, sometimes I would just swing a sign and say you know I tried to do unconventional signs at, at a certain point I realized I didn't really like uh, embarrassing myself by saying I needed help I would like one of the signs I had I'll try to find a picture of it and put it in here but it was like have a nice day um, and I had it on my backpack for a long time um, and I would just you know swing that sign uh, I remember one at one point my dog, so I had my dogs uh, tied up, and at first I just left them near my van, and I was hoping maybe they'll stay close to the van because that's where their food and water is. Turns out, when I rode down the hill to Flagstaff, uh, one of my, my small dog, she panicked and she stayed put, and she was like squeaking and scared and crying, and she was terrified by the time I got home. But my bigger dog took off, and... Um, the path she took based on who found her and where they found her she had to have gone at least like 15 20 miles um, and you know the shelter picked her up and it was 300 bucks to get her out or whatever and it was it was a nightmare and I was terrified I was like destroyed like finding that she was missing I was like oh no what have I done and I just I was like breaking down you know I was really having a mental breakdown and that was really when I started to go crazy there I really I I hit a downward spiral when my dog disappeared. Um, I met a lot of cool people there. I, I remember I met a girl at a at a party house. It was like a trap house or something, but it was it was like a house that everyone was always partying all the time. It wasn't like a crack house or something, but it was just like every there was always a party happening there. And I remember I met this girl there, and she was like, "Will I ever see you again?" And it was like really cute, and we. I probably, I, I forgot how to get back there. I totally would have gone and, you know, dated her or whatever, or just gone out with her for a minute. Um, but I couldn't even find it. Um, I, like, there were so many places that I remember going to there that I couldn't find my way back to later. I just, like, lo wandered off and lost track of where they were. Um, you know, a lot of the time I'd go somewhere at night and then I wouldn't know where it was in the daytime. Um, so anyway... Uh, that was my attempt at getting to my first piece of land, and I never got there. I remember I drove past uh, the town. There's uh, the, t the closest town, I believe, is Holbrook, or maybe uh, St. Joseph, uh, or maybe Winslow, one of those. And it's just way off in the desert, uh, almost on the Navajo Nation, um, you know, near near Holbrook or whatever. And as I was coming, I remember I came back to New Mexico to go back to my mom's because I just gave up. I was like, I don't have the resources to do this, and this isn't working. And as much as I don't want to go home, uh, I don't really have an option at the moment. So 
I went home, you know, never made it to Milan. I remember I gave a, a guy a ride to Albuquerque, I think, or maybe Santa Fe. Uh, he called me back later, and he's like, oh, Santa Fe's so great. It was, it was one of my homies that I met uh, out there in the street, and he would sleep under my van. I think one time he slept in the van, and I slept, or he slept, like, in the front seat or something. I'd frequently have people, like, I would sleep in my little bed and have my little bedroom area, and somebody else would sleep, like, in the front seat. Um, just to get out of the elements for a night, you know? Um, and so, you know, that was, that was one of the people I, you know, gave him a ride and took him out of there and brought him to New Mexico. And I don't, I don't know what happened to him. I don't even remember his name. I had his phone number for a while, but you know, when you meet people like that, they might have a phone number for a few months, but, um, it's not going to last very long. Uh, you know, once you lose track of them, you just lost track of them. You might run into them again, but that's about it. Um, and I, I remember that was also the first time I heard the, the phrase, the term dirty kid. Um, so yeah, that was my Flagstaff experience. Um, I'm kind of wondering if maybe I should make this a multi-parter and, uh, end the video here and continue it with, uh, you know, the next part. Cause now I feel like I've kind of drained myself of willingness to talk about my past. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, I guess, thanks for watching. I appreciate your, uh, observance here and, uh, your, uh, willingness to just let me talk at you on a camera. Um, have a good rest of your day.